let me start the recording. So, so welcome to the second talk of the first day's uh, webinar. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Bishwajit Basu, who is our next speaker. Uh, professor Basu is uh, a professor in the School of Engineering at Trinity College, uh, Dublin, in Ireland. Uh, he received his uh, master's and PhD degrees from IIT Kanpur uh, in 1994 and 1998, respectively. Uh, he has a second uh, doctorate degree from the University of Vienna, uh, which he received in 2019 uh, in mathematical physics. Uh, he has held uh, several positions, uh, several visiting positions, as well as uh, his position at Trinity College. Uh, for example, he was a visiting professor with Rice University, Houston, uh, in the USA. Uh, he was a guest professor with uh, Aalborg University in Denmark. And he was a distinguished guest professor with uh, Tongji University in Shanghai in China. Uh, his uh, research focus is on nonlinear hydrodynamics, geophysical flow, wind and wave energy, and control theory. Uh, professor Basu has received several prestigious awards, such as the President of Ireland EU FP7 Award, a Research Champion Award in 2013, the Kobori Prize from the International Association of Structural Control in 2014 and the Fieldwork Award from the Journal of Sound and Vibration in 2015. Uh, he's also on the editorial board of several reputed journals. And uh, we are very thankful that uh, Professor Basu has agreed to give the talk. And the title of today's talk is Mathematics and the Ocean. Over to you, uh, Mr. Yeah, th thanks, uh, Manjil. So can everybody hear me uh, clearly? Yes. OK, good. So uh, first of all, um, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to get the invitation from the organizer uh, of this um, workshop um, or international workshop, I should mention, um, uh, and particularly to my friend Manjil, obviously, for inviting me to give this talk. And I'm delighted to deliver it. Now, um, uh, obviously, um, uh, I know that this is not a classroom lecture, so I have kept all the um, mathematical technicalities uh, to a minimal as far as possible, though I have to talk about a few things um, and mainly present what the challenges and how mathematics actually helps us in understanding what goes on in the ocean. And uh, so that's why the talk uh, today is on uh, mathematics and the ocean. So I'm going to share my screen now and um, And in fact, before I begin, um, maybe um, just uh, okay, is it now clearly visible? Yes. Okay. So um, uh, what Professor Sharma mentioned about uh, Virat Kohli's comment about uh, not um, being able to use mathematics, uh, what he had learned uh, in the school. I think it would have been more apt if he had said that he had only used mathematics all his life because that's all we do. Whatever we do has some kind of mathematical basis behind it, um, either directly or in, indirectly as we have seen. And in fact, uh, our aim uh, in doing everything is to uh, make a quantitative assessment. So do calculations, do measurements, and if you have to do calculations and measurements, the only way you can do it is using mathematics. So uh, if you do not know things or you cannot know things precisely, obviously then uh, that doesn't fall into the realm of mathematics, but then that's not a precise science either. So science cannot progress without mathematics. And in fact, and not just science, but all other areas that we actually uh, uh, are involved with, including our daily life has a, uh, a profound uh, application of mathematics. And indeed the ocean obviously uh, requires a lot of mathematics to understand uh, how it uh, actually behaves, what goes on and what are the features uh, actually it shows. Um, when, when I was asked to give the talk, I chose this topic because, um, well, a few, few different topics uh, came to my mind, but I chose this in particular because of one particular important issue which people have been talking about, which has a lot of social, economic, po political connotations, but um, uh, the most important thing, which is actually the scientific basis is the least talked about, and that is climate change actually. And when we talk about climate change, everybody has an opinion on that because obviously it's so uh, 
closely connected to our daily life. And as I speak, I can see that there is a, a weather changing uh, outside, which has been influenced uh, because of some uh, oceanic interaction and some depression probably that, that has been created. So uh, the role of ocean uh, on human life and existence is actually uh, quite uh, deep. And to understand that, we need to understand um, obviously how the mathematics actually of the ocean works. Um, in, in fact, I should also mention that um, people also think about atmosphere being influenced by turbulence and atmospheric turbulence, which is obviously the correct uh, thing to uh, look at. But when uh, I sometimes uh, tell people, and actually it's a, uh, a surprise to them, is uh, that the main uh, cleansing uh, sequestration of the carbon that takes place uh, is actually because of the ocean. So ocean actually absorbs most of the carbon that we produce and keeps the overall environment clean, in fact. So that is a very important aspect of uh, the, the, the behavior of the ocean and how it actually influences the climate, for example. And of course, there are other dynamics of the ocean which will influence the marine life uh, and obviously uh, anything that is in, in um, dependent on marine life, including the human beings, obviously. So it's a combination of this lower atmosphere and ocean. And um, this particular area, uh, which is termed called physical oceanography, was only uh, systematically um, uh, started or, or was studied since the 60s onward, 60s and 70s. And that too, in a more observational way, where um, people were not able to make precise calculations and models. And that's where we need the mathematics. So in oceans, we know that uh, there are ripples, very small waves because of surface tension. There are tsunami, which are very large waves, and they are also sometimes actually break. But also we have very large waves, which can actually propagate without breaking, in fact. And then, of course, we have the phenomenon of wave breaking. So in my talk, I'm going to give you a flavor of how all these things actually happen and what are the underlying mathematical principles behind all these uh, phenomena. So uh, the rich features of ocean, um, and obviously we need mathematical approaches to study, analyze, and not just understand, but also uh, do calculations based on various kinds of um, uh, water flows or oceanic flows, for example. The first one is called the equatorial undercurrent. And this is actually also uh, called sometimes the Cromwell current. And I think most of you have probably watched this um, um, movie of Titanic, which was hit by this iceberg. And uh, in the ocean, uh, this is sometimes actually deceptive that when you see the top um, layer of water flowing in one direction, the layer below might actually flow in the opposite direction. So when you actually uh, try to maneuver and move in the forward direction might actually have a great resistance, but also there may be uh, ice which are floating beneath and actually in the opposite direction. So that could be actually uh, quite devastating. There are uh, Antarctic circumpolar current, we know, uh, and very uh, interestingly, while Arctic, for example, is getting melted, uh, Antarctic, we see a larger deposition of ice actually taking place. And then we have the Arctic gyres, which are circulations. We also have point vortices. And there are spectacular um, uh, photographs you might have seen on how plastic actually moves in ocean. And all these things are actually governed by um, principles of physics, which needs to be described by mathematics or mathematical physics, actually. So um, in fact, uh, I recall uh, Sir James Lighthill, um, uh, was a mathematician, uh, was a professor for uh, UCL for quite some time, um, uh, was in Cambridge and Manchester prior to that, uh, and the person who, who started sort of the field of biomedical uh, engineering and oceanographic, uh, biomedical fluid dynamics and oceanographic fluid dynamics, said that um, in the area of fluid dynamics, there are two groups of people, like the hydraulic engineers who observe things but are not able to explain those. And there are mathematicians who uh, uh, explain things which cannot be observed actually. Uh, and the merging of the two actually uh, brought up this area of mathematical physics started by Hilbert and Courant and others, for example. 
And <clears throat> so um, we will be using various kinds of mathematical approaches and develop those for studying all these features in uh, ocean and see how uh, we can get very useful information, but also spectacular uh, results. So my talk will uh, obviously uh, uh, mention about various mathematical tools and some approaches that are developed uh, to study various kinds of things, but mainly focus on some of the results that we can get and why it's so useful to use those uh, mathematical techniques. Uh, I should also men mention about this El Nino or La Nina, which is actually the uh, current that you know that uh, brings in the warm water to the east coast of, uh, to the west coast of uh, um, the US, and also has an uh, impact on upwelling and, and downwelling, for example. And uh, all these waves and currents in the ocean would be uh, our focus for the next uh, half an hour or 40 minutes, say. So uh, when we want to describe the waves in ocean. Um, naturally, uh, they are water waves and nonlinear water waves. And there are two uh, interesting comments made, one by Feynman and the other one by uh, Heisenberg. And Feynman said that water waves that are easily seen by everybody and which are um, usually used as an example of waves in elementary courses are the worst possible example they have all the complications the waves can have. So they're the more com most complicated kind of waves. But the beauty of mathematics is if we understand water waves, we will be able to actually uh, look at various other waves which have the same kind of properties like the rogue waves in water waves. We have similar kind of uh, uh, waves in nonlinear optics, for example. So various aspects of communication, nonlinear uh, optics, laser will actually be uh, benefited by using these kind of information. The other thing is uh, the progress of physics, which Heisenberg said, will to a large extent depend on the progress of nonlinear mathematics uh, of methods to solve nonlinear equations, which we still don't have proper approaches to solve. Because the only way, uh, if I can think of in a um, general setting, you can solve a nonlinear equation is by approximations or iteration. So you have to linearize and solve the linear equation and then maybe iterate and get improved solution. And that in very simple uh, language uh, is called newton Rapson technique. For example, for those who are undergraduate math students here would know that actually you solve nonlinear equations by assuming um, a particular solution. And then what you do is linearize the solution or, or linearize the equation, take a linear uh, approximation and take a small step, get the next step and keep on updating like that. So uh, various other fields in mathematical physics, nonlinear physics, plasma physics, magnetohydrodynamics, astrophysics, and even marine biology uh, would be actually impacted by this. And in fact, I've actually written uh, something called a viruses in the ocean. And that's because uh, it was not until maybe last two decades, so until 2000, people even didn't actually know, but also didn't believe that you can have viruses in the ocean because we know that virus needs host. It can live only within the human body. But now we know that there are viruses in the ocean. And the movement of these viruses are actually uh, influenced by diffusion, by advection, and by um, uh, dispersion uh, because of the movement of the water waves in the ocean. And there was an article uh, I read um, that was published back in 2019 in September by a Canadian scientist and who said that we had observed um, a very special type of virus, which is basically the SARS virus, the COVID of today. Um, in the gills, that is the respiratory system of salmon fishes. And that was actually way before we came to know about the, the COVID virus. So who knows that uh, how that might have influenced uh, the, the flow in uh, the ocean might have influenced the uh, movement of the virus and, and uh, might have impacted globally as well. So uh, obviously this is something um, that is very important. And as I said, the virus in ocean obviously has uh, quite uh, uh, a detailed uh, uh, analysis to be done, of course, but uh, these techniques can be equally applicable uh, for those uh, problems as well, which you're also working on, for example. Now, I'm just briefly uh, and actually very quickly going through the historical development here, because just to show the importance of this particular area uh, of nonlinear waves, 
and that is uh, almost a century and a half back actually, uh, this problem of nonlinear wave propagation was actually uh, conceptually looked at and Stokes made some contributions and actually showed that you can have a wave of greatest height possible where you have a stagnation, meaning that a, a, a top part has a corner or a sharp edge actually. And that is very uh, interesting because normally we think of waves as sinusoidal or smooth functions, but a physical sharp edge at the top, uh, which, is shown, uh, which has been shown by Stokes to exist, actually is also a hallmark of water waves in the ocean. Because if you think of uh, ocean waves, they have very sharp crest and flat trough. And I'll show some photographs uh, soon after uh, these slides. And then subsequently, people looked at it uh, over a century. Um, in twenties, by uh, Levi Civita, Nekrosov, uh, Kiddy Norbury, and um, there were other people who have looked at all these things. But it was not until um, back in nineteen eighties that uh, John Toland, uh, uh, MacLeod, I mean, they made some uh, uh, significant uh, contributions and systematically studied and uh, were able to develop. Uh, some theory for analysis of these kind of waves and obtain some results as well. Some of those are all also exactly true. And I'll talk about the importance of exact results in mathematics very soon as well. Now, <clears throat> the, the, the waves obviously uh, um, flow in water, but uh, assuming that the, the water is irrotational, that means there's no vorticity, is an approximation. Now, there are situations where we have no vorticity or irrotational water waves, but there are a number of situations where we have vorticity. And therefore, uh, looking at the, the water wave movement in the rotational setting is quite important. And it was not until actually 2004 that uh, a global bifurcation or solution of large amplitude waves, which were steady, uh, that means it actually moves without breaking, uh, were proved by uh, Constantin and Strauss. And that is important because until then, though there's some observational uh, evidence and numerical simulations, but we've generally thought that you can actually have large waves, normally in the shallow regime near the shore, but as they approach, they will actually break and dissipate. So uh, continued movement of very large waves over a large distance because of dispersion um, uh, was actually not proved only uh, it was in 2004, this was actually really proved with uh, the presence of vorticity. So this is actually a landmark paper uh, and seminal work. And that actually sparred a lot of uh, work in water waves again, because the techniques those are being used uh, differed from what it was used previously back in 60s, 70s, when people were mainly looking at sort of series expansions and solutions mainly uh, driven by people working on fluid dynamics and hydraulics and so on. So, um, and there came the techniques in terms of more uh, topological methods and uh, an analysis and use of um, uh, maximum principles and, and things like those, which gave some exact results and, and they were very important. Also uh, in 2009, um, uh, the work by Wallen, Eric Wallen actually showed that you can have, for example, these are kind of cat size. So you have these vortices inside the water wave. So you can have these kind of features like Kelvin's cat and, and cat size. So these structures, which are below the water surface, were only um, uh, obtained uh, by theoretical analysis very recently. So you can see the importance of these uh, because unless we do theoretical analysis, we, we won't be able to know that these kind of things exist. And in fact, we'll show very soon that some of the things that we have actually observed by our mathematical calculations uh, in the ocean uh, maybe have been conjectured but has not been observed and actually is very difficult to observe. Really. So, uh, and again, I should mention that in 2016, uh, there's been some theoretical work which has shown that you can have uh, these weird kind of limiting waves. So you can see the first one has a shape which is quite exotic. The second one obviously has at the top, a corner point, and the third one has overhanging profile. So these can be possible if you have vorticity. And these kind of waves are actually um, possible in reality. Not always they will actually 
occur in the presence of just normal water, but you can have other fluids as well. You can look at cryogenic problems and, and helium and uh, superfluidity as well. And, and these kind of waves might actually play a very uh, interesting role in those cases. But you can have some of these also in water in more complex situation. Here I have a, a sort of a, a um, summary of the recent development you can see over the last two decades. And you can see a lot of the work that has been done actually in the last 10 years uh, uh, have really uh, made significant uh, development uh, in um, moving or advancing the field forward. So I'm not going through all the details here, but uh, th these are all uh, mostly mathematical papers looking at various uh, aspects of the physical motions and extracting physical information based on mathematical analysis. The techniques that we normally use here, uh, and some of you were uh, probably uh, undergraduate math student, might have taken a, a course in differential equation, uh, and you might have uh, come across uh, techniques such as maximum principles. And this is in a very simple way you can say that uh, we have studied in our uh, school days, that if you have a function, and we know that by looking at the derivative, uh, you'd be able to say, if there is a maxima or a minima, because if the derivative goes to zero, we know there is a stationary point. So similar things can be expanded or extended to uh, apply to various other uh, uh, differential operators, including differential equations. And we'll be able to say the behavior of the solutions and see where maximum and minimum take, takes place. And that would actually tell us about solutions of partial differential equations without even trying to solve them. And this is a very powerful technique. You can understand that while solving a lot of difficult uh, differential equations needs uh, techniques, sometimes even numerical, but if we can say something about the solutions without solving the problem, then that's great. And this is only possible because of mathematics, actually. That's the beauty of mathematics. We try to do things based on sound logic. And logically, we try to derive certain things which actually give us very exact results. So, even second order elliptic equations and parabolic as well, not just linear, but nonlinear as well, uh, we can actually deal with very complex boundary conditions and we can tell where the maximum might be, where the minimum might be, how various uh, quantities might actually vary. And these are all given by strong and weak maximum principle. So where is the maximum? Is it inside the domain? Is it on the boundary? How is the behavior? Is it increasing? Is it decreasing? All those things can be actually uh, obtained by using these kind of techniques. And harmonic functions are very special functions in that regard. Uh, and we can also have superharmonic, subharmonic functions, and they play another uh, very important roles as well. And I've given some uh, references here, like Protter and Weinberger, Kuche and Sirin. These are very good books if uh, you want to look at these kind of principles. And you can get a lot of exciting results without solving equations. And uh, here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some of these results or develop certain uh, theories behind uh, these kind of maximum principles and uh, apply it to waves in the ocean. So I take uh, a setting, which is called a moving frame. That means I move with, with the wave. And if I move with the wave, then what happens is the shape of the, the wave remains actually intact. So you can see this blue curve with relatively sharp peak and flat trough actually is a wave in the ocean. And I'm moving with the wave, with the speed of the wave. So that's the wave speed. And that actually allows me to look at the stationary problem. So the coordinate transformation is capital X minus CT, where C is the wave speed, T is the time, X is my original axis. Now I'm working in this small X axis, which is the stationary axis. So in this process, what I've done is I've actually taken the time out, though I'm looking at a solution, which is obviously a function of time. And this is called a traveling wave solution. And the existence of these traveling wave solutions actually give us uh, information about various kinds of things, including I mentioned about this the virus flow problem. So if there are traveling waves, means waves which actually don't decay, they keep on moving over very long uh, regions, then actually the virus in the ocean can travel over very long distances, in fact. And it can be shown uh, that that happens. Now, uh, this is again a reference where you can get some mathematical theory behind this. But I'm going to show you some results, how we can actually obtain from um, these kind of principles. So uh, before I do that, I should also mention about the governing equations that we normally take here and actually uh, 
try to see how we can uh, obtain uh, various information from here. So this is my traveling wave solution. And this is my um, axis. And you can see the equation I have here basically gives me the first one corresponds to the momentum in the X direction. The second one momentum in the Y direction. And because the Y direction, the vertical directions, we have a gravity term here. And <clears throat> these two are together called the Euler equations. And we have nonlinear terms here, you can see because of the product. And <clears throat> this equation doesn't have the viscosity terms. If you add the viscosity, what we get, what is called the Navier-Stokes equation. But the Euler equation is very important and useful as well, because for most of the solution that we do in hydrodynamical setting for water, we can use this because this is uh, uh, describing the motion of the bulk water. And uh, bulk water doesn't have viscosity. It's only near the boundaries where the viscosity actually works. It's also true for uh, air as well. In fact, you know, CFD calculations, I recall, we used to um, go for something called a panel method where we solved uh, the problem without the viscosity uh, in the main domain, and then near the boundary, we solved the problem with the viscosity. Even for numerical weather forecasting, a lot of the uh, equations, a uh, lot of the problems that we solve in numerical weather uh, forecasting uh, actually use the Euler equation. And then um, after the first two equations, the next two equations correspond to the continuity, mass conservation. The fourth one is the, visco uh, not the viscosity, it's the equation for vorticity, that is the rotational effect. So if you have no vorticity, this omega is zero. And then we have some boundary condition that the vertical velocity is zero at the bed, flat bed. On the top, we have a kinematic boundary condition, means that the surface actually remains at the surface. There's no interaction between the air and the water. And the last equation actually gives us the pressure boundary condition, also called the dynamic boundary condition. Though apparently it looks that P equal to P atmospheric is a linear equation, but from the first two equations of momentum, like the Euler equation, eventually this turns out to be a nonlinear boundary condition. And this is also something um, that relates to what we uh, know as Bernoulli's condition in fluid mechanics. So this is the general setting that we're going to solve. And obviously this is a very complicated system. We can't get a solution of this, not just because it's nonlinear with very complicated boundary conditions, but also because of the fact that if you notice that eta, which is actually the surface profile of the water is an unknown. So that means the domain that we are trying to actually use for a solution is also unknown. So if you have known domain, you can actually use numerical techniques like finite differencing, um, uh, finite element, and you can solve the problem. But if the domain is unknown, then, or the domain itself is a solution to the problem, then it becomes a very difficult problem. It's called a free boundary problem in mathematics. And this is still an unsolved problem. And there are ways to actually deal with it and go around this, but this is no general way to solve this problem. So, um, so uh, I'm now going to show you some results uh, on how we can actually deal with those very nonlinear equations use maximum principles and solve the nonlinear wave current interaction. And we assume that uh, our current is uniform and the strength of the current is given by K. And we have three conditions uh, possible, like the current strength is greater than the speed, equal to the speed and less than the speed. And we analyze this uh, by using maximum principles and some results from functional analysis. And these are some of the results we can actually get without even solving the equation. And as I said, the the reference to my paper, you can get all the mathematical details, which I'm skipping. But the interesting results uh, I'll show here, for example, it says that the vertical velocity, so this is my fluid domain, and this is the, the surface profile here. This is the bottom surface. And this problem is also interesting because people uh, historically have looked at deep water waves. They've also looked at shallow water waves, but in most cases, say in the ocean, um, it's between two to three kilometers where you will have a finite depth. It doesn't actually relate to the shallow water wave uh, approximation. It's also not deep water wave uh, theory applicable there. So it has to be a finite depth. And for that, you have to assume that depth is D and then you have to do the calculations. And that's where all these maximum principles become very useful. And we can show that the vertical velocity is always negative on the left side of this domain. 
particle velocity is positive on the right center of, of this domain. Velocity is zero uh, at this crest line and zero at the bottom. Similarly, you can actually get information about how the horizontal velocity actually uh, changes um, in the domain and within the fluid, because this is something that people have not looked at much until in the last 10, 12 years, as I was saying. So here you can see that uy, that is the gradient of the velocity u along the y direction, that is actually negative when you move along the y axis from minus d to the top. So here you can see if you go in the opposite direction, if this is decreasing, it increases from here to here. Then in the middle, like when x is from zero to L over two, which is half the wavelength, you can see that this is again from here, omega, uh, ux is less than zero. So it's actually decreasing here. And then we go to the top, it's also decreasing again from the last equation here. So we can see that actually we have a profile of the velocity, which actually <coughs> strictly increases as we go from the crest to trough along the three lower sides. And then obviously, if you look at the top, it has to then from here to here, it's continuous. So obviously it keeps on increasing from uh, left-hand side to the top here. So these are qualitative results we can actually obtain by using maximum principles. And these are exact results. So when you're doing numerical simulations, um, we can actually then check whether our calculations are correct or not. Because once we uh, discretize our equations, we are not solving the differential equations anymore. What we are solving is a discretized or an approximate version of the equation. And that's why these are very important. We can also use complex analysis. We do actually use those and map this particular domain with this unknown on the top to a domain which is rectangular. So we use some kind of complex transformations and then we can deal with this new domain and then look at the equations here and solve the problem. And these are some of the analytical claims we have here. The interesting thing we can actually get is uh, say for example about the pressure and pressure uh, is a superharmonic fu fu function and that can be again computed. And you can see here that the gradient of the pressure actually decreases as we go from uh, right to left here and left to right and then from top to bottom. So if you go along this direction given by the arrow, the pressure will actually keep on decreasing. So this is uh, an interesting result that we actually find from here. So uh, this gives uh, um, information about the gradient of the pressure. And again, this is an exa exact result that we have. The most interesting thing that is observed is when we have the condition that k equal to c. So k, if you recall, is our current strength and c is the wave velocity. If the current strength is equal to the wave velocity, then based on these analysis, we actually find that the flow that we'll have is uniform with a flat surface. That means you cannot have any wave which actually has k equal to c condition, or that means if the current actually is moving with the same velocity as the wave speed, then you cannot have a wave. So in fact, the wave cannot exist. So that is a very interesting uh, result, which has been observed by others, uh, but this is actually a proof that we get from this analysis here. So without doing much of calculation or mathematics, just by looking at equations and using certain uh, mathematical principles will be able to get very interesting results like this. So non-existence of a wave result is this. Uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, so somebody is asking, can you please explain what is a superharmonic function? Yes, um, so so if you uh, to go back to here, so you can see that I have the uh, equation ux plus vy equal to zero and uy minus vx equal to omega. And I said that if I have um, rotational waves, then no vorticity, then omega is zero. And if I take these two equations and differentiate the first equation with respect to x and the second equation with respect to y, and then add the two, then I get a second order different partial differential equation uxx plus uyy is equal to zero. So this gives us basically an elliptic equation, which is harmonic. So u is a harmonic function. Now, you may not always have a differential equality. You can have sometimes inequalities as well, like inequalities we have in equations, algebraic equations. 
So if you have the condition that uxx plus uyy is greater than or equal to zero, then that is actually a subharmonic function or u is subharmonic. And if you have uxx plus uyy less than or equal to zero, then that gives a superharmonic function. So if you now consider the pressure P and by using the equations I have shown here, the Euler equations and certain conditions here, you'd be able to get uh, a differential equation or rather not equation inequality for P actually. And that will uh, tell you that P actually has a form which is something like less than or equal to zero, eventually in terms of the second order differentials. And that uh, means that P then is uh, a superharmonic function. Sorry, greater than zero or equal to zero. That, sorry, pardon me, less than or equal to zero. That tells you that uh, pressure is superharmonic. Thank you. So uh, again, um, without going too much of technicalities, because then things become very technical when I try to prove the large uh, amplitude wave existence, because you know, people did believe that uh, these kinds of waves exist. And uh, we have shown that this can also exist with uniform current, but also with vorticity as well, generally. And uh, classically in Microsoft, you use an integral equation and you can use those integral equations and then use some of the topological methods to show the existence of these kinds of waves. Now, these are important because when you're doing the numerical calculation, as I said again, uh, uh, you can check certain features you, you expect like, if the top is a corner point with stagnation, when stagnation, I mean that U is equal to the velocity of the wave uh, propagation, U equal to C, that means the top uh, point is not moving actually stationary, then um, that's a stagnation point. That means the particles will not move actually there effectively with respect to the wave uh, motion. Uh, and those kind of things can be actually uh, confirmed by these uh, uh, existence results and other analytical techniques. And therefore, when we are doing the numerical calculations, either we have to take special care or attention about these regions, like corner points and these kind of kinks that might be there, or also uh, um, validate the results in terms of what we have got numerically, they're correct or not. So that's why it's very important to prove these kind of existence. Apart from the fact that obviously um, we, we do actually get mathematically useful and beautiful results as well from here. Now, as I said that, uh, because it's very important to actually also numerically see what's happening and the theoretical work that we have done helps us to um, check certain numerical results. So uh, the results we have from maximum principles to integral equations and numerical finite difference eventually uh, can then be used uh, for developing what we call continuation method for numerical bifurcation. So when we are trying to, uh, to compute these kind of waves, they're not easy because uh, you see laminar flow is like a flat surface and we are trying to find these waves. They're very special solutions you're trying to get. So numerically, you cannot actually obtain those straight, in a straightforward way. You have to actually get the right guess. So to obtain those uh, solutions uh, numerically also is quite challenging. And for that, we use some special techniques in mathematics. So we start from um, the, the flat surface and then we perturb it by a small amount. And then we actually approach uh, the curve of the solution by using something like newton Raphson, but not exactly, and then obtain the solution. And all those things are guaranteed because of the existence uh, result I've just now shown. So this is my bifurcation result here. So you can see that I start from this value close to 21.9 and slowly as my, <clears throat> this is Q is the head. So head of the flow increases, and then the wave height increases. It's quite nonlinear, you can see, and until a point when it actually turns around. So this is the point, when you cannot have any further wave, in fact. So if you actually look at this, now this is the point when I have this kind of waves, they're smooth. And then if I go further up at this particular point, you can now see this very sharp peaks appearing. So if I didn't know this from my theoretical calculation, I couldn't have actually guessed this just by numerical simulation, that how to actually go through this curve, how to approach the top and so on. So this bifurcation actually is very important uh, to, to prove theoretically uh, uh, until we can actually do something more numerical. Now, use of these curves will be shown at the later stage of this talk when I'll use it for an application actually as well. But these are some of the papers that were, where we have shown the existence, we have done some numerical simulations as well. So I'm going to quickly go through this now. These are bifurcation curves and when the 
uh, uniform current is there, you can actually get very different curves on the right hand side. And these are now particle paths. Now particle paths are very important because I've told you that when you're looking at this flow of plastics in ocean, what we're really looking at uh, basically is the particle path. Also when you're collecting debris, for example, like ship wreckage or aircraft wreckage, then where to find the particles and where to find the deb debris would be guided by these kind of simulations, for example. Now, um, next we go to the flow with the vorticity because initially I said irrotation and uniform current obviously mean the current is constant. So it does actually have an irrotational setting. But when we have a vorticity function omega, then um, there is actually a way to describe it in a compact way. And we use something called a stream function. And stream function basically uh, gives you the velocity. If you take the gradient of this function with respect to x, we get the vertical velocity. And if I get the gradient of this function psi with respect to y, I get the horizontal velocity minus the speed. So relative to the speed. And with this, I can actually get an equation which actually is elliptic now. You can see that this is del two psi del x two plus del two psi del y two. So it's like the uh, Laplace equation. And here, omega is the vorticity. And it is interesting and non-trivial actually also shown by uh, Constantin Krauss that this uh, gamma, which is the vorticity function, is only a function of stream, uh, the stream function. So it doesn't depend on anything else. So if I convert my domain into the stream function, then uh, at every point, effectively, this gamma is defined, or the vorticity is only dependent on the stream function. So if I know the stream function value, I can actually get the vorticity. So that's very interesting. And then we have the boundary condition, psi equal to zero and minus uh, m at the surface and the bottom. And the pressure condition, now you see the last equation has become quite nonlinear because of these quad terms here. So even though that P equal to P atmospheric was very uh, uh, innocent looking question, it's not at all innocent, it's very complicated actually. And this is in fact called uh, an oblique boundary condition as we'll see later, very complicated. And the difficulty is because of this nonlinear boundary condition. Now your equation is linear because this is a linear equation, but this is actually nonlinear. Well, linear in the sense that if I have a value of constant vorticity, or no vorticity, this becomes linear, but this is the nonlinear part. And this is very difficult to deal with then. But there is a way to actually deal with it. And this is actually a reference of book by Adrian Constantin, uh, where all these things are described in a very nice way that you can actually change the variable and define something h, which is called the height function. And again, you have a rectangular domain now. And the rectangular domain is actually easy to deal with because now my domain is defined. So previously my problem was the domain was not defined and, uh, and I couldn't solve the problem. Now uh, I have actually defined the domain because it's a rectangular domain here, but I've transformed the difficulty to this nonlinear boundary condition here that this is actually nonlinear. So I can't still solve the problem here, really. but it's easier to deal with in a way. And then with this height function, I get this set of equation. The first is called a quasi-linear elliptic equation again. Um, non-linear because of these terms, but again, this is linear in the second order. And this is an oblique boundary condition, non-linear boundary condition. And h equal to zero is what we have at the bottom. So this is actually the fixed uh, non-linear boundary value problem. And this is useful because it can be used to look at various analytical results, but also numerically set up the solutions. And we'll see that very soon. I'm not going to go through these details here, basically, I'm showing how to solve this by using finite differencing. Um, there is another uh, recent work we have done in the context of uh, conjecture, which we sort of partially proved uh, called the uh, Benjamin Lytle conjecture, which said that uh, fluids in a flow, you have basically uh, the Q I showed is the head, the flux of the motion of the mass obviously uh, is there, but there's also another third parameter called the flow force. And Benjamin Lytle con conjecture said that the existence of the formation of the wave depends on certain conditions on these three uh, quantities, like the head, the flux, and the flow force that we have here. And that is not basically well known, but what we proved in this paper uh, here uh, is basically when does that actually flow becomes a wave solution. And that's important because as I mentioned, when trying to solve it numerically, we don't know whether there'll be a wave solution or not. So by using arbitrary parameters, you won't be able to get a wave solution at all even. So 
uh, it's very important to actually have some analytical setting and know certain things theoretically. And the interesting thing is that this is also going to give you a transformation which converts the whole thing in a rectangular domain. That's because look at this integral. When I have y equal to minus d, that is the bottom surface by definition, then s is equal to zero because minus d to minus d will be zero. And on the top surface, when y equal to uh, the surface profile, which is eta x, then we can show that s differentiated with respect to x is equal to zero. And if d s zero dx is equal to zero, this is the term, then s zero is independent of x. And that means we can define the top surface by a constant value as zero, and that actually converts the whole thing into a rectangle again. And I'll just tell you the ingredients of the proof here, and we're using various mathematical techniques like variational approach where we uh, linearize the problem with the uh, perturbation to begin with. So this is the small amplitude solution. We try to find the infimum of this functional f and within a suitable space. So it's very important to find the solution uh, in a certain space. So that's why we use sometimes Sobolov uh, space, which is the right space to deal with because we have certain requirements on differentiability and smooth functions and satisfaction of certain boundary condition. And over the space, we try to find the function that satisfies the solution. And this is important because if you're trying to look at the solution, uh, if the solution is not smooth, then numerically that poses problem as well. So it's not just a mathematical setting or a very theoretical thing we are doing, uh, not a pure mathematical um, uh, jugglery or, or uh, exercise. It has very deep, profound uh, numerical implication as well. And then can show the existence of these small amplitude waves. But uh, in that setting, which we call the local bifurcation, uh, we can actually linearize the operator. So instead of like linearizing the equation as we do in uh, newton raphson as I said, here what we're doing is we linearizing the operator, actually, the differential operator, and then trying to find the solution by linearizing it, exactly as we do in the nonlinear uh, case. And in doing so, we use something called the crandall rabinovich bifurcation theory. And in that context, we use something called a Fredholm operator. And what is a Fredholm operator? So, you know, if you have a matrix, we know that's a finite dimensional vector space. So we can exactly say that, okay, you can write the solution in terms of a linear combination of various vectors. But when you have a differential operator in a function space, it is infinite dimensional. So if you have an infinite dimensional space, we cannot actually say whether we're really going to have a solution or not, unless we do an infinite number of summation. So to uh, restrict that to a sort of finite kind of approach, we use a freedom operator so that beyond a certain um, limit, we can actually say that there is no other uh, possibility and we can actually see that the solution is within that uh, particular space. So freedom operator actually give that, uh, gives that uh, feeling of the finiteness or, or shows that in this context of uh, global, sorry, local bifurcation. So I'm not going to the details of all these things, but these are quite technical, but I'm trying to impress that all we are doing here actually are very important um, for uh, doing the numerical calculations, which I'm going to go to very soon. And then when we come to global bifurcation, it becomes very technical. You can also go through all the details in the papers, but these mainly deal with, uh, again, global bifurcation theory, and you can't really use perturbation. You can't use perturbation because the large amplitude solution doesn't actually follow the perturbation path. So we use a generalized lee Schauder degree theory, initially developed by Kilhofer and then further extended by Hilly and Simpson. And using all these topological concepts, we try to show that we have a solution, wave solution, which is perturbative. So part of the solution, get a small wave solution. And then we try to get a large global solution, which continues uh, for in, like, uh, in, uh, for, without actually um, coming back. And we also show that the global solution has one solution in that small uh, part of solution. And that way we actually kind of connect the solution together. And that gives us the global solution and the existence of those. And then we eliminate certain uh, cases and look at the bounds on the continuum, look at the nodal patterns of the solution, how it behaves at the corner points and things like those, and then use certain es estimates as well. So I'm not going to go through all the technicalities here because uh, don't want to bore people with that. But all these things uh, now prepare us to solve problems that we want to look at in terms of the ocean um, flows.
Now, ocean flows are, are much more difficult uh, in the sense that it's not a single uh, domain. In fact, uh, there are multiple domains and you have a top layer, which is actually uh, quite warm. And then there's a, a bottom layer, which is quite dense and cold. And there's a sharp change of density of about 1% which separates the shallow layer of the warm water to the dense water below. So um, this stratification actually has quite a number of various important things and changes the density, which is basically picnocline and changes the temperature, which is the thermocline. And <clears throat> normally uh, people have used shallow water wave theory, linear theory, and so on. And typically you can see that uh, we can have surface waves like that, but we can also have something called internal waves. So beneath the surface, we can have waves which can have amplitudes of the order of 100 meters actually. So waves which cannot see even on the surface and they have very strange features as well. The interesting thing is that in mathematics, we use sometimes uh, perturbation which needs a small parameter, but similar perturbation theory allows us, us to develop approximate equations. And because of the fact that the density is changing by 1%, it's a very small amount. So that can actually act as a small parameter. And we can actually use this small parameter to uh, linearize the equations and get uh, other kind of differential equations from the set of uh, various um, simultaneous uh, partial differential equations that we were dealing with. So, uh, so with this, uh, obviously, you can see that because of this top layer and bottom layer, we also have the fact that the trade winds that actually drives the, the surface wave or the water in one direction. And below that we have an undercurrent which is moving in the opposite direction. And this is along the equator. This is called the equatorial under, undercurrent. And the Pacific one actually leads to this El Nino effect, for example. And so we can actually model this stratification, model this movement of the current. Actually, you can see the wind drift going from east to west and below that we have movement from west to east. And we use singular perturbation theory and then uh, try to derive the equations and that we need a um, systematic mathematical approach because the, uh, the approximation we made have to be justified. So that is another thing why we need this theory or mathematical theories because it, people have done things with ad hoc approximations and they've obtained results which were not correct in fact. So if you want to actually see what the impact of the approximations are, then we have to develop the theory systematically and then relax those approximations one by one and see how we actually do. So these are very important approaches we actually use in oceanographic uh, calculations. And, and obviously here we have various uh, literature, but I'm going to focus on a recent developed model called the Constantin Johnson model. And I'll show you some simulations which show some spectacular result, but also, uh, uh, confirms the presence of this micro El Nino over a four to seven year cycle, for example. So I'm not going to go through the governing equation, which is now time dependent. You can see that previously we had a uh, uh, traveling wave and we took the time out of it, but now we can't do that. We have to keep that here, but we'll use some singular perturbation theory with a small parameter identified. And then we do various approximations. So these are actually very important. Without mathematics, you can't do these approximations. So that's the strength of the mathematics. And that's the beauty of the mathematics. By doing certain approximation, you simplify things and you actually know how much error you're actually making and you can exactly find that out. So that is where the precision comes in, in fact. And then we deal with spherical coordinates in this case. And non-dimensionalize is another mathematical technique we use because when you have scales, for example, here we are dealing with uh, a scale between um, the two sides of the equator um, between the, uh, in the Atlantic, uh, and that's of the order of thousands of kilometer. And within the depth, actually, we have only few hundred. So therefore, on one side, we have few kilometers, and the other side, we have few, few hundred. So unless we non-dimensionalize, the importance of certain parameters won't be exactly obtained. So that is what we are doing here. And with those things, then we can go for what is called asymptotic solution. So these are exact solutions, but with certain approximations. And then we model the undercurrent here, as I've shown here. So- Sorry to interrupt, uh, this was it. You have yeah. five more minutes. Okay. So I'm going to quickly go through the rest, uh, mostly the solutions and the, um, uh, how, how we look at the solutions. Uh, as I said, these are asymptotic solutions. So these are the plot of velocities obtained from uh, the equations I've shown. These are 
So U is the uh, horizontal velocity and V is the vertical velocity. And you can see that there are very uh, strange features like here, over here, kings. And that you cannot um, obtain actually by experimental observation. You have to then scan the whole ocean, which is impossible, but we can actually see these things here. Then we can have streamlines. We can see that these are cellular structures, which are actually known that that means the water from here cannot actually go uh, beyond a certain level. It has to stay within this level. And then you have another cell at the top. And this is another in-plane velocity map. Here we can see that you have multiple cells, for example. And in fact, if we move along uh, from the east to west along the equator, uh, these features are changing. In fact, I have a, a video here which shows that. So you can see a single cell and then a second cell, a weak one on the top appearing and then the two marches. Single cell and then a second cell appearing and the two marches again. Uh, uh, sorry, because I think the video is not uh, been shown on our screen. Oh, okay. Oh, there's a pause, I think. Um, Uh, can you see the video now? No, we still see the still presentation. Okay. I think you have to probably stop the share and reshare again. Yeah. Anyway, I'll, I'll move on to the next few slides then because. Uh, but you can see that uh, as we progress from um, the east to west, you have these two cells, single cell, and then eventually again, two cells appear. So these are kind of transient features. And these are never possible to be actually uh, exactly observed unless you know this from previous calculations and know where exact, exactly to look and how to look. So these actually provide very useful information for oceanographic uh, explorations, in fact. And these are the cellular structures that we have here. Uh, sorry to interrupt again. I think uh, the slide has frozen uh, from your end. Oh, okay. Um, maybe it's better to reshare once again. Uh, now, I, now we can see the cursor, yes. Okay. So can you see now? Yes, yes. Yeah. So can you see the 3D flow paths? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, so what I was showing is basically the, these flow structures which are evolving with time. You can see two cells, one cell, one cell, one cell, and then the two again appearing. So this is along the equator if you move. And this is only possible from this analysis that we have done, and this will actually aid the oceanographic uh, explorations in the field, for example. And these are various streamlines and the structures. So you can also have one cell, single cell structures. But the more interesting thing is the flow paths. In fact, you can see that in the 3D flow path, you have certain discontinuities here. So if you exactly know the location, you can actually look for this. And this means there's a sharp discontinuity in the downwelling. And flow of the nutrients and mass and other carbon can actually take place along this gradient. And this is something that is, uh, has been conjectured, but this is actually something that only can be obtained by the analysis that we have done, for example. Also, you can see you have something called uh, sub subsurface ocean bridges. So that means whatever is here will go down and then come up at a different location. So this is basically the connection between two points uh, in the space and through this subsurface bridges as well. And you can also have upwelling, which we know from um, uh, El Nino. And this is what we see here. So you can see that how powerful mathematical tools are to actually obtain these kind of things. Also, I'll go to uh, some of the analysis to show you some particle paths, but also to give you a flavor of the uh, bifurcation curves. Look here, the bifurcation curves have a gap actually. And this is uh, basically because of the analysis we have done, we are able to see this. Otherwise, you probably will end here and say, well, there's no solution beyond this. But now from here, we know that there's some, some solution which actually reappears again. So some wave solutions actually disappear after a flow, uh, a value of 29 point something, but reappears when there is a stronger flow again uh, flowing. So that's remarkable. You can also have uh, negative pressures actually. So subatmospheric pressure in the fluid, which is very counterintuitive as well, you can see from here like one minus 1.6 here. 
But the most uh, interesting thing that you can see is particle paths. So you can see here with certain vorticity and layered. So this is basically layered simulation, like in the ocean, you have a curve like this, or sorry, flow path like this. But now see what happens if I change the vorticity. Come on. Particle paths are very different. So in fact, from the top, you can see particle paths which are not closed. And in the bottom, you have closed particle paths. And there's been a debate for very long whether the particle paths are closed or not, circular, elliptic. And now we see they can be not even closed, but they can be closed and also non, not closed depending upon the location. And this can be all obtained in this, uh, some of the papers we have here. In this. And finally, uh, we also have wave breaking and using at asymptotic analysis, matching and functional analysis, we can prove when a wave will break. And that depends on certain initial condition. That means initially the profile of the slope of the wave will determine if a wave is going to break or not. If this condition is actually satisfied, then um, we can actually tell right from the beginning when the wave is going to break or if at all it's going to break. So it's not that the wave breaks at a later point based on the condition, but it is really the initial condition that depends or on which it depends whether it's going to break or not. And here we have done some simulation eventually to show a wave that was started actually uh, and that based on the condition, we show that finally it, you can see that the, the slope here become vertical and then after a while it's now going to plunge over here. And because we can't do an analysis beyond this point where to stop because the plunging one is not possible because we don't have a function or a graph of function doesn't give multiple points, you see? So you see that's a mathematical difficulty again. And finally, we've used all these things to uh, simulate some response of a wind turbine, offshore wind turbine. So all these things will probably change our uh, analysis and results that we do in offshore engineering. And we have applied all these things and obtained responses of offshore wind turbine, but also will be applicable for other offshore engineering applications. And coupling uh, this flow with the uh, system in the ocean will give us the fluid structure interaction problem. Okay, so I conclude my talk uh, just by showing this figure. Uh, and you can see these are gyres. It was actually um, seen um, from the NASA spinning gyre to Saturn's North Pole. Um, sorry. And, uh, and this can be simulated by hydrodynamic models for astrophysical flows, for example. So all the techniques I've, uh, I've mentioned are very useful and they can be used to also simulate these kinds of things. So um, can you see my screen actually? Yes, but uh, it's not uh, moving. Yeah. Okay, okay. now we see. So just to conclude that uh, I have actually gone through a, a gamut of mathematical approaches uh, and, uh, and shown how uh, they can be used for modeling, analyzing, simulating various types of water waves and currents in ocean flows. And I have highlighted the importance of exact results, but also the significance of those in numerical anal analysis and simulation, particularly uh, when making approximations or informed uh, mathematical approximations, I would say. So thank you so much. And sorry for, I think, taking up a little bit more time. Thank you so much uh, for the nice talk. Um, so let me again remind the audience that you can ask your questions by putting it in the chat or by raising your hand. Um, there's a raise hand feature in Zoom that you can use. Uh, also, you can ask your question in your own language and we'll try to translate. Uh, and I think Biswajit already speaks Bengali. Uh, so if it is in SMEs, I can translate it to him. Um, so I have two questions already in the chat. Um, I'll put them to, to him uh, and then please, uh, uh, take this opportunity to ask any question that you might have. So the first question that I got was, uh, I mean, since th this is a problem with uh, Assam uh, year after year, so maybe because of that, the motivation was to ask this question. So the question is about, uh, can uh, using your techniques or theory, can we model uh, when floods will occur? And if so, uh, how to mitigate uh, those floods? Yeah, <clears throat> so, so I have a PhD student actually, uh, working uh, with a former PhD student of mine, who is a professor in, uh, university in um, close to Calcutta, Hora. It's called the Bengal Engineering College, previously called its Indian Institute for Engineering and um, Sciences and Technology, IIEST, actually. 
one of the, the oldest engineering college in India, in fact. Um, so, they, so he's actually looking at uh, this particular problem of looking at the flood. And the motivation was, I have a friend who works for public, public works department in India, actually, and he's an irrigation engineer. And he uh, told me that uh, there is actually an institute called the River Research Institute that was formed by Professor Meghnath Saha. Uh, he was a mathematical physicist, obviously, very, very well known. Uh, and they look at various problems and they have looked at uh, problems of hydrodynamics using mathematical physics previously, but they have a lot, lot of data as well. One of the things they find interesting is that they design um, sea walls for uh, preventing coastal erosion. And they have found that um, the, the action of joint wind and wave actually causes more erosion. So we wanted to investigate that. And obviously to do that, we had to look at the water wave, in fact, and uh, the effect of flooding and so on. Um, and uh, and uh, my student has been looking at various, uh, so I have basically asked him to, uh, to, to model the problem from ab initio, like the Euler equation I, I mentioned with approximation, but also we are looking at various um, softwares people have used, like there is a, uh, one called uh, GeoWave, FunWave from um, the University of uh, Delaware, actually this group, um, and they have done a lot of work. Um, there's a group in TU Delft. Uh, there's a group in Japan. So we looked at all those softwares and we found all of them have certain approximations of the other, but not everybody has done things very systematically or mathematically actually, in fact, without assessing the, the effect of these approximations and so on. So, uh, so, so the short answer is we are making an attempt uh, now, obviously, flooding is a, a much more difficult problem uh, if you look at it mathematically, because there's so many different things you have to model, and you can't model all those very precisely. Uh, but yes, this approach will actually work there. And uh, so my friend tells me that they might be able to give some uh, information on data as well. But also, uh, there are certain codes in India um, for designing and against flooding. And he told me, um, and I, I know about this as well, there's a group in um, Denmark and they had some uh, software also, they have a group works on this. So they actually helped in writing the design code for India back in 1967. So since then, they haven't updated the code actually. So I think there's a dire need for <laughs> looking at those code all provisions in India for flooding and doing whatever, whatever is appropriately needed. So uh, if that answers your question. <laughs> so another question More than mathematics, I think. <laughs> another question was, again, uh, I mean, is what, what you have done or what your techniques, are, are they useful also in meteorology and weather forecasting? Similar techniques? Yes. Uh, so as I mentioned, that a lot of the weather forecasting codes are uh, based on solution of Euler equation. And uh, they normally look at uh, the, the atmosphere and um, and, and then some aspects of the lower atmosphere. The factor that is still not completely integrated is the interaction of the ocean with the atmosphere, particularly the lower atmospheric part. Uh, I haven't shown things here like uh, Ekman spiral. So we assume that the wind actually blows in a certain direction, but uh, on the sea surface actually, and also on the off surface as well, because the Coriolis force, but also the ocean currents, the wind is actually, actually going to turn by a certain angle. And that angle will change as you go up. So this is called an Ekman flow. So uh, this is one of the effects, but, uh, but clearly uh, the, the lower atmosphere needs more mathematical attention. And, uh, and, and I think people, a uh, lot of people who had been in mathematics moved to physical oceanography or uh, oceanography have done certain work, but uh, still I think we need more mathematicians to look at things more rigorously and uh, uh, with right approximations in the field of this physical oceanography. Because there are people who are doing things uh, uh, qualitatively. They're, they're important too, like geographers, but they don't look at the mathematics section. Um, so this is one question that I got from a student. Um, uh, so um, the question is, what book should we follow to know more about mathematics of oceans as a beginner? Uh, what are the prerequisites to study uh, this subject? Yeah, so um, I'm trying to think of, uh, I mean, there are several books actually. There's a book by uh, uh, Jeff Fallis. Uh, he was a professor in Princeton. He has moved to 
Exeter, actually. So uh, close to you <laughs> until, uh, because you know in Exeter, they have the Metaran uh, in the UK. They have their office actually in the University of Exeter and they support a lot of the work there. So he's, he's, he's in Exeter now. Uh, he has written a nice book actually. And it's on um, geophysical fluid dynamics. So the, he has a very big book, but also he has um, uh, an abridged version of that for like final year undergraduate students. So could you repeat so that could the be name once again? Um, it's, it's, I think, atmospheric fluid dynamics or geophysical fluid dynamics. The author is Jeff Vallis, Jeffrey Vallis. Uh, I have shared it in the chat so that the yeah. students can take a look. Yeah, Jeff Vallis, yeah. Um, there are other books by, there's more uh, quantitative, de descriptive des description, more descript descriptive uh, analysis given by uh, Tally, T-A-L-L-E-Y. Again, and her book is also well known. I mean, she's, I think, a part of this ICPC, thing, you know, the International um, Panel for Climate Change, I IPCC. IPCC. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one, one more question that I have got uh, just now is, uh, so I'm not sure if, yeah. So the question is uh, like, uh, uh, what, what is the uh, difference between the theoretically predicted models and the things that we actually see, how much difference it makes? Yeah, so um, I, I didn't go through all the, uh, the, the approximations made and so on. So in, in uh, oceanography and geophysical fluid dynamics, there is a, a, a theorem called the Taylor-Proudman theorem. And that was based on something called a geostropic balance. So that means uh, if you have a wind-driven force acting, and if you have another force, which is Coriolis force again in the opposite direction, then the two nullifies. And it says that, well, in certain conditions, you don't have to take any of these. Now, mathematically, if you look at it, then um, it has a certain restrictive region. But people have used that. Now, I think Proudman probably, I mean, so this is G.I. Taylor from Cambridge. So uh, I think he probably realized uh, that uh, the, the approximation did probably didn't get a chance to refine it, but people have used that indiscriminately for uh, cases where it shouldn't be applied. So misuse of theorem actually may cause more problem than um, helping you, in fact. So uh, this is one example I'm giving. So if there's an unbalance, then you have to take those forces. And under certain conditions, it will get balanced, but this geost geostropic balance might actually get uh, disturbed as well. So uh, if, if you're not doing the right approximation, then you don't get this uh, right. But um, uh, obviously what you predict, what you compute helps you in two ways to, to first of all, to know what you expect to see. So that means it's not just a, a comparison of what your model is giving and what you ex experimentally observe. Of course, that is something and that normally would actually match if your approximation is correct or if you had done reasonable approximation, but it also tells you what you expect to see. Like I showed in my uh, figure like this, Two cellular structures, evolution along the equator. And you don't know this from your exp experimental uh, observation. So you do the initial calculation in maths, you find out what is expected, and then go and do the observation. And then actually your expect experiments become more, or field observations become more stronger. You know what to experiment. Otherwise, it would be trial and error. Uh, I think Devashi has a question. Yeah. yeah. So it was uh, very nice listening to Vishwadi sir. Um, and a lot of uh, things we came to know about oceans and mathematics. So I had a query regarding uh, whether some work uh, has progressed about uh, the tsunami, occurrence of tsunami or predictions or some modeling, mathematical modeling related to the tsunami uh, th that occurs. Is there any such updates or yeah. uh, some good work? Yeah, exactly. So there, there are a lot of models people have done on the tsunami. And uh, typically people started looking at, so tsunamis are single waves. So it falls under the category of what is called, and I haven't covered that, is solitary waves actually, single wave actually. And, uh, and, and uh, people even thought that they were soliton type of wave because you know, tsunami is propagated over a very long distance without actually dissipating. So that gave them a feeling that it was a soliton type of wave as we know in uh, nonlinear optics as well. 
but it is not in fact it is not a solitary wave it's not a soliton it's a solitary wave and uh, in fact people then used uh, shallow water wave theory and looked at this kdv equation but again uh, the you know the boxing the, the indian ocean tsunami that we had seen really the regime of that doesn't conform with the kdv type of equation so it's not really uh, a shallow water wave equation will fit so you have to go for moderate amplitude wave and in fact my wave breaking equation is not just shallow it's more moderate amplitude so you can do uh, appropriate approximations take your original set of uh, partial differential equations and then derive the surface equation from there so these are integrable uh, equations as they call them you know and then get an appropriate equation in the regime that you want so the short answer is yes yes uh, there has been a lot of recent work going on Hello, sir. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, you were. Hello, I think I lost, uh, uh, sir. Uh, sir, once you have mentioned uh, during your slides that uh, with the change in density, the mm -hmm. velocities and uh, that uh, pressure changes can be predicted. How it can be uh, change or uh, if the density is higher denser medium, how it will change and how the mathematical tools will vary related to that. So are you asking about the stratification or you're yes, asking about the, yes. okay. So what happens is that in the uh, stratification case, as I showed also in the numerical simulation, because you have a, a vorticity, so you have a layered shear layer, top and bottom, one may be rotational, the other one may not be. So what happens is that this shear transfer actually changes the overall dynamics. And because of the vorticity, your Bernoulli's equation actually gets uh, changed in fact. And the vorticity has the effect of uh, impacting on the pressure, in fact. So uh, this is the interaction between the, the vorticity and the pressure. So in the rotational case, you have a straightforward relationship. But as soon as the vorticity comes in, uh, the pressure um, um, variation gets very uh, different, in fact. But you can uh, analyze those by using, as I said, the pressure uh, equation and looking at the inequalities and using maximum principles or by using the asymptotic equations. And then in our case, as we have done the um, maximum principles as well. Okay, uh, as a layman, can we uh, go for Bernoulli's equation uh, to study the uh, initiation of this equation amount? Can we go for that uh, using Bernoulli's equation? We, I think uh, we can uh, measure the changes in various aspects. Uh, can we do that? Yeah. yeah, so obviously, you know, Bernoulli's equation gives you the constant. So if you yes. integrate the Euler equation, you get Bernoulli's equation, right? Yeah. So because one is a pressure gradient in X, the other one is in mm -hmm. Y. So if you integrate the two equations, you get Bernoulli's equation. And then you can assume that there is a constant which is invariant throughout. And based on that, you have an equation, but that's a nonlinear equation. And that is the reason why you get the uh, dynamic uh, nonlinear pressure equation on the surface, even though your pressure is constant, P equal to atmospheric. But uh, because of the velocity squared term coming in from the integration of the Euler equation, you get that. But um, Bernoulli's equation will also uh, be valid anywhere in, in the uh, interior of the fluid. Yes. But the question is that you need to know then the velocities U and V inside the domain as well. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so there is a question from a student. Uh, so I think she's asking, so do you know any institute in India where you can study uh, mathematical oceanology? There is one institute. Uh, so I have some friends in uh, Hawaii, you know, in the Department of Oceanography. And they tell me, and so, some of them, they actually specialize in Indian Ocean, in fact. And in fact, Indian Ocean is one of the, the oceans which is not very well studied. In fact, one of the youngest, and there's still a lot of changes going on in Indian Ocean. And the Bay of Bengal uh, tropical monsoon is another area which is not very well studied. And recently there's been some sea campaigns done by MIT in the south of uh, Bengal and Bay of Bengal, in fact, you know. So there's a National Institute of Oceanography in Goa, actually. And um, I do not know people there, but I know people in, Hawaii actually, and they have collaborated with them, but that's what they told tell me. Um, uh, so one final question that I have, um, so just for the audience, I mean to, to explain. So 
uh, my time overlapped with Vishwajit while he was doing a second PhD in Vienna, and I was doing so far my first <laughs> and only. Um, so, uh, so one of the first things that I learned about Vienna was that there were there used to be a lot of floods in the Danube, and then they created an artificial island uh, in the river uh, in near the city. So, is there any mathematical explanation for why they created the artificial island to stop the flood? Yeah, so this is related to wave breaking. You know, this uh, I was talking about the shallow water wave equation. So what happens is that if you have those uh, islands, what happens is uh, the waves which are coming, obviously uh, near those islands, I mean, one is a dissipation that will take place. The other thing is obviously flow, flow gets diverted as well. So the cue will also change, the head will also change. To change of head, uh, the, the shallow water, the dissipation, all these things obviously then effectively will mean that, um, because we have seen that when the height was breaking, you know, once it waves, then the turbulence kicks in and then you don't have a large amplitude wave anymore. So energy then is dissipated effectively. So lowering then, the head and dissipating it eventually. And does it always work for any type of river system or only for specific river systems, this kind of solution will work? So there, there are several, uh, there are several, several river training works done to uh, control flood as well. But then they also say that it has an impact on other things like it will deposit the sediment somewhere else and say if you have a port, then that will cause the port to be unusable you know, because of the sedimentation and so on. So the large ships may not be able to come. Uh, it might have certain impact on the downstream and so on. So I, I think it is not very uh, simple to uh, answer it in a very straightforward way. But uh, obviously uh, people do have looked at various options for uh, flood control like this. Yeah. Um, so that brings us to the end of this session. Uh, thank you so much uh, to Professor Bisuzit Basu for the very nice talk and for answering so many questions. And also for mm -hmm. in the first place accepting the invitation to speak uh, in today's session. Thank you so much. My, my pleasure.